Thank you, Madam Speaker. Appreciate the chance to share some reflections with, with respect to the budget and to the Imp Implementation Act C-19. I want to start by talking about housing. In my view, the extent to which all levels of government work together to address the skyrocketing cost of housing will define my, my community over the coming years. I'm sure that's true for many uh, members in this place for their communities as well. Last year, as I've shared before, it was a 35% increase in the cost of housing in Kitchener. What does that mean? That means we've seen by, by the last point and count study a tripling in the number of folks who are living unsheltered. We're seeing encampments continue to grow folks who are resorting to living in tents. We're seeing st uh, students who are unable to move out of their parents' homes, unable to afford rent. Seniors on fixed incomes whose anxiety continues to rise as they see their rent rising too. I think often of health care workers I met this past summer who were sharing with me that they were planning on leaving, heading further west, because they too couldn't afford soaring costs of rent. And so as I've done here before, I want to start by sharing what I appreciate about what's in the budget. And that's some early signs that the federal government may finally begin to be taking some meaningful action when it comes to addressing the cost of housing. Some specific examples. There is significant investment in this budget with respect to co-op housing. Back in the 80s, you know, 1982, it was 6,500 units we built that year alone of deeply affordable, dignified co-op housing. I've personally had the experience of living in co-op housing. I can attest to how important co-ops are to ensuring that units remain affordable in perpetuity. Well, in this budget, there's a commitment to build 6,000 units. Now, that's not in one year or over, over several years, but it's significantly more than the 477 that were built in 2020, and it's a $1.5 billion investment. Those are the kinds of investments I would like to see more of. There's also a commitment to um, reinvest more funding in the Rapid Housing Initiative, a program that's been oversubscribed. And what does that mean? It means great organizations like Indwell that are looking to repurpose faith com communities to build affordable housing haven't been able to get funds in the past. And my hope is with a renewed commitment to the Rapid Housing Initiative funding, this is $1.5 billion allocated there, that more organizations like Indwell will be successful in, in, in securing funds to build more affordable units. There's also a commitment to end the blind bidding process, which we know would only allow for more information to be shared that could also address the crisis we're in. Now, there's two items that were in the budget that weren't in C-19 that I want to make mention to. One is removing preferential tax treatment currently giving to house flippers. I hope that the government will ensure that this is in future legislation it was committed to in the budget, as well as the Housing Bill of Rights, to ensure that, uh, that we have a requirement to have a home inspection, uh, one of the kinds of things that would help to address the overheated market. And of course, we do need more investments from both the federal and provincial governments in non-market housing and other ways to reduce the commodification of housing. Now, there are several items that I remain deeply concerned about. I'll start with respect to climate, because no doubt we have to be honest. If we want even a 50 percent chance of keeping global average temperature increases below 1.5 degrees. That's what's required for a livable planet. And we do our fair share of the global carbon budget. That means 86% of our known fossil fuel reserves in this country need to remain unextracted. And to do so means we're going to need to invest in workers in their upskilling and retraining and ensuring that they have access to the economy of the, of the future. And organizations like Iron and Earth, a worker-led not-for-profit, have been calling out for, in their case, they called for $10 billion to go to workers for a, proper, a prosperous transition to ensure they had access to the support that they need. Instead, what's in the budget is $7.2 billion directed towards carbon capture and storage, a new fossil fuel subsidy at a time when we're being told that 
these would be phased out. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. We need to be phasing out these subsidies and prioritizing those funds to workers and to proven climate solutions. When it comes to healthcare, of course, this pandemic has exacerbated existing gaps. Now, so I want to pause to reflect on a few other significant gaps that I would encourage the governing party to move forward on. The first is with respect to mental health. Many parliamentarians will say the words that mental health is health, and I'm glad that, that more folks are saying those words, but we need to treat it that way. Mental health advocates across the country have been calling for a new Canada mental health transfer to provinces. And while the budget mentions an intention to engage in this, the only commitment is to a wellness portal. And while I'm sure this is um, you know, a worthy investment, we need to be mindful of the significant dollars that are required from the federal government to move towards parity in mental health funding so that it is true that mental health is health and that we can eliminate the wait times we know are across the country and certainly in Waterloo, Wellington, we're hearing remains to be the case in our community as well. When it comes to long-term care, I had the chance to ask the Prime Minister directly last week whether uh, there would be you know, this safe long-term care act that has been talked about in the supply and confidence agreement between the Liberals and the NDP. Uh, when there are plans to introduce that act, there's of course no mention of that in C-19 or in the budget. In fact, the only mention of long-term care in the budget was with respect to money that was allocated in 2021. This is at a, at a time when we know, you know, just a few days ago, I was speaking again with a woman who was reflecting about her mom who was waiting for a bed in long-term care. With tears in her eyes as, as she was sharing whether, you know, not knowing if, if her mom would make it out of hospital to long-term care. Or I think about the personal support workers I've spoken with who've shared that they're not getting to, to give four hours of care a day. They're lucky if they do four minutes of care a day. And we know there's more that the federal government can and should be doing to put standards in place when it comes and to be investing in long-term care. And I would encourage the governing party to prioritize doing so. Last, I'll pause to reflect when it comes to following through on promises made to Canadians with disabilities. And it's actually one of the areas I've been encouraged by in, in my time in this place that we now have 100 MPs from all parties, including four colleagues in Waterloo Region, who've all together said that this is a time to follow through that we know that Canadians with disabilities are disproportionately living in poverty across the country. 40% of those living in poverty are Canadians with disabilities. It's 1.5 million people across the country. And the governing party has promised to introduce legislation, substantial legislation for the Canada Disability Benefit, a guaranteed income for every Canadian with a disability across the country. In this place, I've had the chance to share stories of folks in my community, of what it looks like and what it means to them not to have access to this, what it, what, it, what it means to be living in poverty as a result of not getting appropriate supports. And so I would continue to encourage the governing party to introduce substantial legislation for the Canada Disability Benefit. And I want to pa pass my thanks again to the, I think it's 103 MPs now from all political parties who've come together to say we can do better and we must. Now, some might say, well, wait a second, this all sounds well and good, but can we afford these things? I want to close by sharing some of the ways we can afford these significant and important in investments, and we don't need to do it simply by increasing debt. We can and should, of course, stop gifting oil and gas companies that are making record-breaking profits. Stop gifting them billions of dollars and reinvest those. We can, you know, we've had a lot of promises about taxing the rich, but the budget reduced the campaign promise for a 3% surtax on some of the largest companies who, whose profits soared in the pandemic down to 1.5. It avoids any talks of an inheritance or a wealth tax, even a vacancy tax, as I've shared about in this place before, in C8, it was down to 1% and it exempts every Canadian and every corporation in the country. Well, in Vancouver, they got it up to 5% and in doing so, They've been able to reinvest millions of dollars in deeply affordable housing 
And of course, there's no talk of closing corporate tax loopholes, which we know is a measure we need to do. And so with that, I'll close and welcome qu questions. Thank you. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Conestoga. Madam Speaker, uh, I want to thank my colleague uh, for his speech and for his ag advocacy. Uh, we share we share a region and we share a city together. And uh, and I know he mentioned Indwell in uh, an organization called Indwell, which is uh, for uh, affordable housing. And, uh, we've all met with them and we're all advocating together. Um, I wonder if he can explain the, the importance of programs and the benefits of, of federal programs like the Rapid Housing Initiative. Uh, with the understanding that at a federal government we can and, and will do more. Um, and also if you can explain the importance of wraparound services because you can't have housing without the supports, you can't have the supports without the housing. And then in, in basically related to that is how the province, in our case the province of Ontario, no, it needs to step up with more health supports for, for affordable housing. Thank you. I will member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And three, let me just share what a joy it is to be working alongside the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. He brings a tone in this place that I think we need more of, a more collegial tone, one of actually working together to get things done. And when it comes to the Rapid Housing Initiative, I couldn't agree more. Indwell you know, is a great example of an organization that we hope through new investments in the Rapid Housing Initiative have that much better of a chance of building exactly the kinds of investments that we know we need. When it comes to wraparound investments, well, what a great chance to talk about shelter care. And uh, in our, our, our community organization like House of Friendship that has learned exactly what it takes to not only provide housing, but to ensure that those who are, who are, who are living in shelter have access to the mental health and the addiction support services that they need on site. And with him, I'm so proud to continue to let others across the country know the successes that House of Friendship has had in our community that can be replicated in others across the country. Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and thank you very much for the speak, uh, speech for my colleague. One thing that he spoke about was mental health, and that is something that I have seen that is absent from this budget. 62% of Canadian parents are saying that they have seen the mental health of their children go get worse. Out of the Pediatric Association, they are seeing more self-harm, two to three times higher when it comes to things like self-harm and eating disorders. I'm just uh, looking for his thoughts on what we should be doing for mental health and how this government should be helping out more. Thank you. Well, member for Kitchener Centre. Well, thanks, uh, Madam Speaker, through you to the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London, um, in particular for her leadership on the status of a women committee. Um, we need to recognize how um, having women chairing committees like that changes the substance of the conversation in really productive ways. When it comes to mental health, well, we need to only be looking to what mental health advocates across the country have been calling for. And that is a parity in funding, that there is a significant funding gap. Specifically, what they've been calling for is 12% of health funding to go towards mental health. And that's the kind of investment that we need to be honest with ourselves is both significant and necessary if we're going to eliminate the wait times that are plaguing across the country. Thank you. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for reporting you. Thank you. During the April 7th uh, budget plan, there was a question at one point of being able to send an infrastructure transfer on the condition that, that what the province would, would do would be to the federal government's liking. I would like to know the opinion of my colleague on this. That is to say, if infrastructure transfers or in any other program that may be, should be tied uh, to a judgment call by the federal government about what Quebec and the provinces will do with that money. For Kitchener Center. Thank you, Madam and Madam Speaker, and thank you to the uh, deputy pour répondre ni pour sa question. I want to thank the member for répondre for her question. We continue to be learning about in this place that I spoke to the uh, mental health transfer, for example, that this being an example where. Uh, funds would be allocated to, prop, to provinces within their jurisdiction to spend appropriately. When it comes to infrastructure, I'd be glad to sit down with her to understand better how she sees the best way to approach it would be and, uh, and, and to have that conversation with her. 